Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if we may start, I'm, I'm David Campbell Bannerman, those that don't know me, a former MEP and, and uh, chairman of the Freedom Association. Um, may I welcome you all, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, this is the fourth annual Gillian Beck Becker um, lecture. Uh, we had Simon Heffer, you remember, before. Um, and Gillian Becker is a long-standing supporter of the Freedom Association. She's now in the United States, um, but she's a leading author, journalist, and lecturer, uh, South African-born. She specialized in research about terrorism, um, such in her book, uh, Hitler's Children, the story of the Bader-Meinhof gang. Um, and uh, she did a lot on what she called the hot spots of the Cold War, which is uh, nicely phrased. Uh, and she also co-founded co the Institute for the Study of Ter Terrorism. Um, and um, she's been involved recently in the, the archive has mysteriously disappeared of the Institute from the U University of Leicester. We wonder if wokeism has gone a little far in academia there. Um, but we are very grateful to her for her conviction and for her generosity in, in sponsoring this event. Um, as I say, I've been, one thing I would say, I've been chairman for a couple of years now, but it's extraordinary in 40 years of politics, I've never seen such threats to freedom, basic freedoms, like, like free speech, free association, free expression. Um, and so I think the Freedom Association has never been more important than it is now, actually, as a real challenge ahead. As you probably know, not all of you will, but we were formed in 1975, uh, and we are non-partisan, uh, and we're classically a, a liberal campaign group. Um, and we, we, we fight for individual liberty, freedom of expression, and the free market. Uh, we campaigned against vaccine passports recently. Uh, <laughs> anyone? Any masks here? No, it's freedom association. Um, and ID cards, we're against that as well. Um, uh, the BBC license, we've been working as that. <laughs> A lot of GB news read, uh, watchers here tonight. Um, and the Freedom Association through the Better Off Out group was one of the first to campaign for Brexit, and it did a really good job. I can, I can testify that. Um, so under my chairmanship, I wanted to focus on free speech, defending free speech, and on getting rid of the Human Rights Act, or at least uh, seriously reforming it. And it's good to see Dominic Rabb actually on the case. We've been in touch on that. We have 10 principles, just to lay those out very quickly. One, individual freedom. Uh, secondly, uh, personal and family responsibility. Thirdly, the rule of law. Limited government. Free markets, I mentioned that. National parliamentary democracy, strong national defense, a free press and other media, uh, freedom of religion and belief, and then freedom of speech, expression, and assembly. And that last one we've had to put into our freedoms because we thought it was obvious, but it no longer is. Uh, um, so uh, I, um, it was funny, Lord Frost said recently, how, when was the last time you heard someone say it's a free country? I, I can't remember actually for years people say that, but that's how far we've gone. I would say also about the Freedom Association, we're like a bridge between political parties and groups right across the political spectrum. It's quite uh, a common mis misinterpretation of the Freedom Association. We're not just of the right, we're not hard right or anything. Um, we actually have some Labour members now uh, like Brendan Chilton has just joined the council of the Freedom Association, and he did Labour leave very well. I think you're here tonight. Where, where is he here tonight? I think Brendan, or oh, maybe not. But um, <clears throat> but he's uh, he, it's great to have him on board. We need more Labour as well because obviously freedom cuts right across the political spectrum, and they should be as concerned about it as as we are. Now. Um, when, you know, we're talking about bringing parties and groups together. So it's absolutely ideal to have Nigel Farage here tonight uh, and to welcome Nigel. Um, he is, in President Trump's words, Mr. Brexit. Uh, and I think he's deserved that accolade. And I think our country owes him a huge debt of gratitude.
It was my honor to serve under him as deputy for four years, and we worked closely again on the Brexit referendum. Um, and I pushed within the Conservative Party very hard to get a referendum. Um, and I, I think we, Nigel and I, and all of us here, believe in putting country before party. Um, you know, we've both lost our jobs as MEPs, but we're happy to have done so because it's better for the country. Uh, and I really do, I can personally testify to Nigel's courage, principle, and tenacity. Um, we wouldn't have a referendum without Nigel, and we certainly wouldn't have got Brexit without Nigel Farage. So, um, now, also, I should mention, we have members like uh, David Nuttall, who put the amendment forward to get the referendum. Um, and we had 83 Tory MPs vote for that amendment against a three-line whip. So there's the whole other side of Conservative MPs supporting a referendum, which I think was very key and forced Cameron's hand, and we got the referendum. So, but Nigel really did attract millions of Tory votes, dare I say, to back UKIP and then the Brexit party to lend their vote, and I think that was very, very important. And in the European Parliament, just to wind up, uh, Nigel was right down the front, and he was really surrounded down the front. He had to his left, appropriately, uh, the president of the commission, Barroso, Juncker, whatever, you know. Um, and then on the right, he had all these Eurosceptic, uh, yeah, Euro-Federalist groups, apart from the ECR, of course. Um, and then you had the council, the president of the EU council right in front of him, and then the president of the European Parliament looking down on him. He was completely surrounded. And I, I, I said to Nigel, what was it like? He said, the noise, the noise. He gets all this barracking, you know, uh, all the way. And the thing is, Nigel was a one-man opposition. Uh, and it was, it was so important because the European Parliament doesn't have an opposition. You know, they all agree. It's all consensus. And he was a one-man opposition and, and played a really key role. And I would say just lastly, you know, when it came to the 2019 referendum, Nigel had, was far-sighted enough to back Boris Johnson and to get that majority to see off these undemocratic MPs. They're back again. You see what they're up to now. Um, but, you know, to break that impasse that could have destroyed Brexit and brought it down. And that was down to get Nigel again. Um, so I think... Uh, I think we deserve an awful lot. Uh, you know, Nigel deserves a lot of praise, what he's saying. I would say, just finally, that Nigel actually nearly died three times. He fell off a cliff. He was hit by a car. And, uh, of course, on election day, when I was walking to vote, I got news he had been smashed into the ground in a small plane, which really is not funny. And it's amazing what he's done, how he's recovered. Uh, from all of that. So I really do mean it when I say we're very lucky to have him here tonight. <laughs> um, and uh, really looking forward to him speaking uh, about freedoms as he sees it, you know, taking it beyond Brexit, but to other freedoms. And of course, finally, he's made a wonderful impression as a very fair and polished presenter at GB News. So we're delighted to welcome. <laughs> So may you please welcome Nigel Farage. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. God, it feels like the old days, doesn't it? Back in a room plotting because the political establishment has once again betrayed us, led us down like a cheap pair of braces, and we have to organize a people's fight back on behalf of our ancient liberties and freedoms, things that those that went before us fought for and that we're not going to see given away without a real fight. Yeah. It's scarcely believed that it's been... I guess this must be the first speech I've given in London since the 31st of January, 2020, that moment we left the European Union and we were there in Parliament Square celebrating. I did the countdown, 10, 9, 8. There must have been, from the aerial pictures, at least 100,000 people there. 
I mean, they were, you know, the square was full. They were backed up in the streets. The BBC, I think you're out of practice. You've been locked down for too long. Let's try it again. The BBC. <laughs> no, I won't even mention Channel 4. I, I, I dare not go there, you know. The ceiling might not cope with it. But it was funny, the BBC chose not to even cover the event at all. And where were the Conservative Party with their 80-seat majority? Were they celebrating the rebirth of the independence of our nation? No, they were modestly in number 10 and Boris banged a gong. And it was rather like the morning after the referendum in 2016. You know, people said to me afterwards, how did you sleep that night waiting for the result? Sleep? <laughs> I was at a nightclub. <laughs> I mean, after 25 years of wanting this so badly, I was going to celebrate whatever the result was. And when you saw the next morning, Michael Gove and Boris Johnson interviewed, they looked like frightened rabbits. What have we done? So what I've kind of learned, I guess, relearned over the last couple of years is that the Conservative Party, despite using Brexit, for their career opportunity, in the case of Boris Johnson, for their electoral opportunity, in the case of the 2019 election, and notwithstanding, there are some very, very good, decent people in the Conservative Party at every level. But the Conservative Party itself hasn't reformed, hasn't moved on. It's the same old globalist Conservative Party, except now it's gone further. Now it's full-on socialist. I mean, you only have to look at what Rishi Sunak's proposing. Lots and lots of taxes, and then, and then money to be dished back and redistributed in a, in a myriad of ways more complex than even Gordon Brown could have devised. When I used to work in financial markets, I should be good about money. I can't work this out. We put a 25% surcharge on the electricity bill. We put a 5% surcharge on because the EU demand it in terms of VAT. And now because the bills are too high, we're going to give you some money back against that tax. But we're also going to put your taxes up on the 1st of April, so we'll cut your council tax. I can't work it out. Maybe you, maybe you can. Um, and then we've got this full-on drive being led by the Prime Minister. And she is a very powerful Prime Minister. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's good to be back, David. Thank you for inviting me. I have, I've, I've really missed doing this all, 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 the, all this time. I really have. This completely insane drive to net zero which will lead to yet another massive transference of wealth from those that frankly haven't got the money to those that have got the money. And I, I saw this racket back in 2015 when I was fighting the general election, leading UKIP, and it wasn't the, it wasn't the easiest place to be without, I mean, zero media friends, and it was, it was rough. But it was really interesting to see that, you know, there was David Cameron talking about wind energy, and of course, his father-in-law, who's from Lincolnshire. In fact, whenever Samantha Cameron's asked, where are you from? She says, I'm from an estate <laughs> in North Lincolnshire. <laughs> it's not a council estate, believe you me. <laughs> it's, the kind of, it's the kind of estate where you put down game every spring, you know. And there was, there was David Cameron's father-in-law earning a thousand pounds a day for having wind turbines planted on his land. There was Nick Clegg. What a shame for his Facebook options. 
that the price collapsed 26% yesterday. No, honestly, it couldn't happen to a nicer person, could it really? But there was Nick Clegg, whose wife Miriam was a highly paid non-exec director of the biggest wind farm company in the Iberian Peninsula. And there was Miliband, whose wife, as a lawyer, earned the lion's share of her money working for companies, processing applications for onshore wind farms. The whole entirety of the British establishment totally sold in to the wind energy project. And now we learn years on, it doesn't actually work. When the wind doesn't blow, it doesn't work. And we have to rely on fossil fuels. And now we import 5 million tonnes of coal every year, over 40% of the natural gas we need every year. And again, this being done by a Conservative Party. But the worst thing, the worst thing the Conservative Party have done, even worse than not actually fully capitalizing on the benefits of Brexit. And what we need is genuine supply side reform right throughout our economy. You know, there are five and a half million men and women out there running small businesses, taking risk, working their butts off, often, often not owning very much money doing it. And nobody in the Conservative Party is capitalist, capitalist enough or free market enough to understand that we can really rail back on much of that Aki communitaire and help them. But the worst thing of all that the Conservative Party have done is to become a dictatorial status party, happy to take away our liberties, to take away our freedoms, and they appear to be very reluctant to give them back. That is not what conservatism has ever been about. That was always the fundamental divide between status socialism and conservatism, which believed in the individual, which believed in freedom of speech, which believed in freedom of association, which believed in individual liberty. And they've lost all sight of it. In fact, even though, and David's right, on the Brexit battles, I mean, thank God for the Spartans. Thank God for the Spartans. Amongst whose number, amongst whose number did not include Boris Johnson or even Jacob Rees-Mogg. You know, that's been forgotten by many people. Twice they voted against the May betrayal. On the third occasion, they fell into line. So the Spartans were good on that. The Maastricht rebels were good. The 83 MPs were good. But on liberty and freedom, there's only David Davis. And there is literally only David Davis in the Conservative Party who gets up every time through lockdown, every time since the pandemic, when this stuff is proposed, and asks why we're doing this. And what's it all for? I thought, as I was coming over here this evening, what the founders of the Freedom Association would have made of the situation we find ourselves in Today, I was thinking of Viscount de Lille, VC, the first president of the Freedom Association, and of course the magnificent McQuirta brothers. Now I never got to meet, I never got to meet Ross, because of course he was murdered, as you know, quite shortly after the organization was formed. But Norris, I did get to meet, and Norris was one of my first enthusiastic backers and supporters. I mean, nobody had ever heard of me. Nobody had ever heard of UKIP. You know, I'm going back to 1998, and Norris believed in what I was trying to do. And night after night, across the southeast of England, as we headed towards those 1999 European elections, Norris would come and stand in a village hall, in a town hall, on a stage with me, saying, back this guy in the election. And Norris was great, Christopher Booker was great, another man that spoke at many Freedom Association events. So I was very lucky as a nobody to have these people supporting me. And I wonder what they would have made of the extent of the loss of our freedoms. But a quick Norris story. So we were due to speak in the assembly rooms in Chichester, as Norris and myself. And this was two weeks 
before the June elections in 99. And of course, it was the first time ever that proportional representation was used for a national election. So I always thought I had half a chance. Anyway, Chichester had a very famous resident at the time. In fact, over 10,000 people had signed a petition to say that Patrick Moore should be knighted. And Norris rang me excitedly and says, and Patrick, by the way, he was also a member of the Freedom Association and possibly one of the greatest eccentric people that's ever, ever lived, <laughs> but magnificent. And a man who flew 43 missions on Lancaster bombers over Germany uh, and won the DFC for doing so. Part of the CV, people have forgotten about Patrick Moore. Anyway, Norris rings excitedly to say, Patrick Moore has read about you in the local paper and wants to come and support you. I mean, I could not believe it. You know, suddenly we've got somebody mega famous that's going to back UKIP and back me. And because of this, the event was being held at 7.30 in the assembly rooms and I got there at 7 o'clock and blown me down. The BBC were there. <laughs> and ITV were there. And one of the, I think one or two of the national newspapers had sent reporters. This was the moment we were actually going to get some coverage. It wasn't just us talking in a room. And I was so excited about the whole thing. Nervous, but excited. <clears throat> and we got to 720, no Patrick. And we got to 725 and no Patrick. I said, Norris, what's going on? Oh, I'll give him a call, he said. He came back looking a little ashen-faced. Patrick thought it was tomorrow. <laughs> so I've got a room full of hundreds of people. I mean, you can't move. It was so full, it was like the black hole of Calcutta in that assembly room. And the press. Anyway, we sent a car down to get him from Selsey, where he lived. And I said to Norris, right, Norris, you go first. Just keep talking. <laughs> and Norris, for some reason, spoke for about 10 minutes and sat down. I thought, oh my God, this is a nightmare. <laughs> so I got up, and I, I mean, God knows what I was saying. And then at the back of the hall, this vast 25 stone figure <laughs> appeared. I mean, he was virtually an eclipse in his own right. <laughs> and Patrick starts to make his stately way towards the platform. Everybody ignores me. They all stand. They all start cheering. He gets up on stage, says hello to Norris, says hello to me. And I think, thank God for the Freedom Association. This is marvelous. This is marvelous. And then he starts to speak. <laughs> he puts the monocle in and says, ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe in mincing my words. During the war, I hated the French and Germans. And I still do today. No, 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 Norris, what have you done to me? <laughs> anyway, he said, I feel better for getting that off. And then, of course, he was charming and he was brilliant and he was great with the media. Uh, and he was a big supporter of me for the rest of his life, as indeed was Norris. So it's kind of nice for me that it goes full circle in a sense that the first time I get back and give a speech in London since we left the European Union is here to the Freedom Association. And thank you uh, to your organization uh, for being the supporters of me, as I hope I have been of you over these many, many long years. But the challenges are enormous. And what's worried me during the whole process of lockdown has been the lack of opposition. Now, I don't believe everything that you, Gov, tell us. I see them somewhat as an arm of government. And it does, of course, depend a bit on how you ask the question. But consistently through this pandemic, there have been solid majorities, not just supporting what governments are doing, but actually urging governments to go further. Now, I do understand that fear is a very effective weapon. And that's what government has used. Horrendous. I mean, some of those radio adverts 
Horrendous adverts. You know, could you look him in the eyes and all the rest of it. But the lack of opposition has worried me. And there is a problem, a big problem that nobody in 1975 could have foreseen. The big battles in those days actually were about people at work, about the closed shop, about the lack of choice. But over the course of now nearly 50 years, the state has just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And all that politicians do and all that lobby groups do is to constantly campaign for the state to get bigger still. There must be money for this and money for that. And I sense that one of the reasons that people, millions of people, don't value freedom and don't value liberty is because, frankly, the welfare state set up for many of the good reasons and well-intentioned reasons that it was has actually made us a part of the state, has stopped us thinking, has stopped us being critical. And whether you look at our economic lives, where the state now controls more of our life than it's ever done outside World War II, whether you look at the amount of tax the state takes, which now, under the high tax conservatives, I mean, could you believe it? Starmer's saying, vote Labour for lower taxes. <laughs> you couldn't make some of this stuff up. But whether it's through taxes or whatever else it may be, the state now plays a bigger role in our lives, in our decision making than it's ever been. And for young people who were brought up with that from an early age, who don't perhaps understand the concept of liberty and freedom, you know, we have got a problem here, an uphill problem here. We've become the most surveilled, the most fined and the most taxed country in what we used to call and would like to get back the free world. It's everywhere. And it's little things, not just big things. Last Sunday, I was dropping one of my sons off at Gatwick Airport. So I turned onto the M23 on what's called a smart motorway. I mean, whether it's a population reduction control exercise, I'm not sure. <laughs> but you turn onto this four-lane smart motorway, and it isn't just that they've taken the hard shoulder out, and that if you break down, you're in very, very, very big trouble, particularly if it's raining or foggy or whatever it may be. But what no one said is the other part of smart motorways is there's a gantry. There's a gantry every 250 yards, and a gantry with a camera. And you're literally driving in fear in case you're over the speed limit. And I could see going to Gatwick early Sunday last week, flash, 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 as cars that are doing 72 in relati relatively easy conditions, people being fined 60 quid and, and three points taken for them. But then I got to Gatwick and that was fine. It was empty. I drove in, dropped my son off, only to see that it now costs five quid. So I was actually in Gatwick Airport from 7.43 till 7.45, but that cost five quid. So I then had to go online, which is a struggle for a technophobe. <laughs> go online, fill in a form, giving them virtually every detail about myself, barring my inside leg measurement, which now Gatwick Airport, or the authority looking at, the company looking after uh, parking there, will have forever. You see, it's in every little aspect of our lives. Every little aspect of our lives. Even going to the supermarket and getting a Waitrose card. If you do that, they know everything about you and they're prepared, of course, to sell that information on. It's going to be very difficult for us to win back against the surveillance state, against the information technology state. But there are big battles that we can fight and we can win. Here's one. Part of this dull acceptance 
that the state controls our lives is that ever since we incorporated the Human Rights Act, the European Convention on Human Rights into British law in 1998, we've forgotten something very fundamental. Our Constitution, for all its faults, our common law system, for its faults, works on the basis that we are born free people and that everything is allowed unless there is a law that says it's not allowed. The very opposite of that is the concept of European human rights, where every freedom, every liberty that you have is given to you by the state. The European Convention on Human Rights gives you the right to life, the right to marry, the right to choose, the right to illegally enter Britain on a dinghy, <laughs> be given an iPhone and a four-star hotel within 20, I mean, I'm joking, but, but you see the point, you see the difference. If you accept this, if you accept we're still part of ECHR, you're effectively accepting a system where the state has that power that it can give to you, but equally it can take back what it wants. And I think Brexit, Brexit's not been completed. We now need Brexit 2.0. And Brexit 2.0 is that we get rid of the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. We withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights. We get rid, we amend, we appeal, we ch repeal, we change the Human Rights Act in this country to get us back to where we ought to be, a country that believes we are born free men and women and the state has no more power than that other than laws that can tell us not to do things made by directly elected representatives that we can fire once every four or five years. And that battle, ladies and gentlemen, is winnable. In fact, I think it's easier to win that battle than it was to win the Brexit referendum. And I think, ironically, what is happening in the English Channel and our complete inability to deal with this, you know, huge numbers of undocumented young males coming into this country posing God knows what kind of security risk to our communities and our future, and actually an outrage to those who are legally and expensively trying to come into the country to take good jobs and contribute to society, let alone the impact on council housing lists or whatever else it may be. That issue, oh, they all think in Westminster, this que the, the question of immigration control has gone away. Oh, Brexit dealt with that, they think. Well, it hasn't dealt with it. And funnily enough, people coming here illegally on, on dinghies, as opposed to the back of lorries, and the fact we can't deport virtually anybody, the fact it took us 10 years to get Abu Qatada out of this country, these are things that have huge support out there in the nation, and it's, again, issues that cross conventional left and right. And I honestly think if the Home Office are right in their estimate that somewhere between 65 and 90,000 people will cross the English Channel this year, people will be looking for solutions. So I think this gives us an opportunity to get to where we need to be, to where we should be, where we get rid of state-given rights and get back to liberties and freedom. I'm also very encouraged by what's happened over the last few weeks on the NHS mandates. Very, very encouraged. You know, I've had the double jab. I've not had the booster, I have to say, but I've had the double jab. But either way, this is a matter of freedom of choice. If you could show me that by having the jab and the booster, that I couldn't catch the virus, or I couldn't transmit the virus, and therefore, 
I would pose a lower risk to family, patients, friends, work colleagues, then I might see an argument. I might see an argument for a vaccine mandate. But that simply is not the case. In fact, statistically, it would seem that many that have had the booster may be even more likely to get a very mild form of Omicron than those that have not been vaccinated at all. I don't want to argue that point to death. I do want to argue the point about freedom of choice. I do want to argue that vaccine mandates are monstrous. And I always felt this one was winnable. And it was just delicious to see Sajid Javid backing down in the House of Commons last week. So we've won that one. And I think we'll actually get the care home sector to reverse their decision as well. So we're, so we're beginning to get an upwelling, an upwelling of people saying, this has all gone too far. And finally, what I want to say is this. There's one particular case in the world. There's one political leader who is standing up for freedom of choice, standing up for individual liberty, who's becoming, I think, something of a beacon to the free world and changing his country in a remarkable way. In April of last year, I just couldn't put up with it anymore. I mean, how can I live with the pubs closed? <laughs> so I decided, I decided to go and I went off to America. I had to quarantine for a fortnight to get in, two weeks on a, on a Caribbean island. <laughs> it's tough, it's tough. <laughs> anyway. But to go to Florida was incredible, incredible. The job DeSantis has done as governor of Florida is incredible, amazing. And I spent time in Florida. I also spent some time in Los Angeles that was closed, locked down. Chicago was literally like a ghost town. And yet when you see the figures, and when you compare Florida, and you compare California, similar levels of wealth, similar climates, the net health outcomes the same, but the mental health outcomes very different. The economic outcomes very, very different. And the liberty outcomes completely and utterly different. And, what, and, and it wasn't a free for all. You know, the restaurants, whether you sat inside or outside, had spaced the chairs more. You would check for temperature going in. They were insistent that you used hand sanitizer. They were taking some precautions, but normal life was going on. And far from there being a vaccine mandate, DeSantis has now passed a law where if a company insists an employee has the vaccine, they'll be fined $50,000. <laughs> and if it wasn't for DeSantis, the whole of America would have been locked down. DeSantis has turned the tide of debate on the powers of the state over the individual in the most astonishing and remarkable way. I regret to say we don't at the moment have a big political leader in Britain who's perhaps got those instincts, certainly not in Scotland, or in Wales, I mean, God, is he the best they've got? That Drakeford bloke, I mean, God help us. And certainly not Boris Johnson. But who's to say what comes after Boris Johnson? Well, sir, thank you, it's delightful, very sweet of you. If we had open primaries, no, I mean this, I really mean this, if we had open primaries, as the Republican Party does in America, because there was this wild guy from New York. He was, a, he was a TV star as well. And he announces in July 15, he's going to run for president. It's the biggest joke anyone's ever seen. And yet he does it, doesn't he? He comes through. If we had open primaries, sir, I would, when this leadership election comes, and it is coming. If anyone thinks Boris is going to survive this, 
I don't know what you're drinking, but I'd like a large one afterwards. <laughs> if we had open primaries, I would run, but we have a closed shop. Freedom Association has sorted that out. Um, <laughs> we have a closed shop, so I can't. But what is going to happen, well, this is what is going to happen. It'll be the summer, in my view. There is going to be a battle for the soul of conservatism. It's coming. Either the party goes with Rishi Sunak, either it goes with social democracy, it goes back to, or it stays with, frankly, the Osborne Cameron way of doing things. It presents itself next to Keir Starmer with almost no real difference between them. Or we get a proper conservative leader that believes in liberty, that believes in free markets, and believes in the things that the Freedom Association was founded to defend and fight for. I don't yet know who the most likely candidate is from that wing of the Conservative Party, but somebody is going to emerge. I can't even say he will win that battle, which wing of the party will win that battle, but I know that debate and that fight is happening. So I would say to all of you, after this period of relative political hibernation, which has been forced upon us, that it's great that this is the first big event that you've put on for the last two years. I'm thrilled to have been asked to come along to speak. And however depressed you feel, however down you feel about the extent to which our liberties and freedoms are disappearing, remember we fought back against that vaccine mandate for the NHS. Remember what Ron DeSantis is doing in Florida. And remember that all of you, with your voice and the pressure you can apply to local MPs, local media, or online, whatever it is, all of you can play a role in this. What I do know from my UKIP days is that just moaning about things achieves nothing. Getting up off your backside and fighting for things can lead to great victories. And I, with, you know, frankly, leaving the European Union looked to be impossible. For many, many years, I was painted out to be the patron saint of lost causes. Well, we won that one, and we need to win that battle for our children and grandchildren to live as free-born British people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Right, that's enough. That's enough. You'll embarrass me. I'm very shy. Now, one of the dangers of speaking in a hall without a clock is you've no idea how, I so said we've actually got less time for questions than I'd planned, but I want to take questions, as many as I can, and I'll try and be as concise in my answers as I possibly can. Take questions on any subject under the sun. Gentleman over there has got the first hand up. That worries me, the one whose hand goes up first generally worries me. <laughs> Don't worry, Nigel, friend, not foe. Um, what is a dreadful thought, but what happens if Starmer becomes PM? If Starmer becomes PM, uh, taxes get cut. <laughs> the net zero agenda will not be as aggressive as it would be under Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> He'll probably even be much tougher in the channel than Boris has been. Um, nothing. I will give Starmer credit for one thing. He's vanquished the hard left in the Labour Party. They are pretty much vanquished. You know, and we should actually pay credit to him for doing that. He didn't have to fight them quite the way that Kinnock did, that famous uh, conference with, you know, Hatton and all those yobs. Um, but the left are vanquished, Corbyn is out, then are completely and utterly marginalised. You know, we've got a, yeah, a big state, high spend Labour Party on the left of politics. 
I don't fear them at all. And that's why the Conservatives will lose the next election very heavily unless they can get back to offering something that is genuinely, genuinely different and offers ordinary folk hope. Because we've lived through a very benign economic period. The miracle of Brexit is Brexit happened in relatively benign economics. Normally, big political change happens in depressions or crashes. I am much more pessimistic about inflation than the Bank of England are, or than indeed that our Prime Minister was in October. You know, this disease of money. Enoch Powell told me, inflation is a disease of money caused by government. It's here to stay. So the Tories have got great work to do, but they can do it under a new leader. We can become self-sufficient in energy. We can bring down gas prices. Many, many things we can do to show that we're actually trying. It needs new, fresh direction and leadership. But the biggest, you know, politically the biggest threat of all is that Starmer isn't scary. Yeah. All right. Next, please. We have got some, there's one at the back there. Young lady, don't recognise her. <laughs> I think she's a fellow GB News presenter. But <laughs> yeah, long, long, long suffering uh, aide to Nigel over many years as well. Um, one thing that really has me ruminating is how one balances the modern outlook on freedom with the sort of social permissiveness that have come from a boundless internet and the fact that virtually people can behave in ways that they wouldn't socially and it's beginning to have an impact back in the real world. When it comes to balancing the love of freedoms and individual agency and then the regulation of the internet, where do you stand? Yeah, look, you're right. I mean, the internet has broken down so many norms, hasn't it? Um, so many behavioural norms. That people now think it's perfectly normal just to walk up to you in your face and start taking pictures of you. People's personal space um, doesn't mean anything uh, to, to a younger generation addicted to the internet. Can government control the internet? That's really at the heart of your question. And I know you're very, very worried about the impact that much of this very dangerous material is, happening, is having upon young people, denormalizing human relationships. You know, this is going on through the internet. Alex, I think it's a very, very difficult thing. There are filters, there are paywalls. The government had promised to do something about extreme pornographic content. That promise, I think, expired three years ago. To date, they've done absolutely nothing. I agree with you, it's a massive challenge. Do I have the answer to it? I don't. And I suspect whatever we do, there will always be ways around it. I'm equally worried about the internet, about the lack of free speech offered by the internet. The day the, day the Taliban retook Kabul, I tweeted, isn't it extraordinary that the leaders of the Taliban are on Twitter and the 45th president of the USA has been banned by Twitter. And ever since that moment, Ever since that moment, my traffic on Twitter has declined dramatically. So I'm very worried about it on both levels. Your question is one of the biggest social questions that affects the normality of young kids and how they're growing up, and I can't pretend to have an answer. We can try. Government said it would try and has so far walked away, but it's a very difficult one. Very difficult one. Let's get the microphone. There's a lady over there. <clears throat> Thank you. Nigel, great to hear you. Um, you mentioned about the um, European Human Rights Act, and um, I just wondered, with the um, Brexit bonus that we were meant to be um, having, other than that, what would you have seen as being one of the biggest Brexit bonuses, and what would you be doing if you were the Prime Minister? Well, I mean, Brexit was about giving us the right of self-government. I never pretended in the referendum or before that just because we had Brexit, everything would be great. This was about us being in control of the levers over our life, our economy. And, and you know, even Adam Bolton credited me with saying, well, at least, no, Nigel was honest about this. Um, not to remove the 5% VAT on he domestic heating bills is the worst politics I've ever seen. At a moment, I mean, what has, 
What has got into their heads in Downing Street? It's an easy win. Um, deregulation. Mass simplification of 150,000 pages of close type legislation is a no-brainer. They haven't done it. We're told it's because they've been busy with the pandemic. Well, the whole of Whitehall can't have been busy with the pandemic. And I know they're all at home drinking beer in the garden, but, but so, so that, uh, you know, obviously our, our global position in the world, some good things have happened. The AUKUS deal is a good thing. The fact that Boris Johnson can speak on the Ukraine, independent of the Germans, is a good thing. Pity he missed the phone call with Vladimir Putin because he was in so much trouble with Partygate. But apart from that, um, so I am seeing on the world stage, and even in Washington, even amongst Democrats in Washington, there's now a recognition that outside the EU, the independent British voice now does have more value. Um, Northern Ireland is a complete betrayal. What is happening to our fishing industry, and perhaps even more relevantly to our fish stocks in the Eastern Channel is an environmental disaster. So there are lots of things we still have to do. The good thing is I believe there's no going back. Now I know the BBC last week went to the Natural History Museum they found Lord Heseltine. They got him out for a few days. <laughs> and he was on every program last week. Why we must rejoin the EU and Lord Adonis. I mean, who the hell is he anyway, as it were? <laughs> Those who know the song. Um, but look, we're not rejoining. Here's the thing. We now own the status quo. It's for them to reverse the status quo. It isn't going to happen in a month on Sundays. We need to capitalize far more on what we've done. And if we're honest about it, I faced the biggest dilemma of my political life in 2019, what to do. And I tried to push Johnson as far as I could. You know, and in the end, the one thing that I really did say was I wanted an absolute specific commitment to no regulatory alignment. Because some of the wording in the agreement was equivocal on that point, and I got the promise from Johnson's team of no regulatory alignment, which was the one thing I thought I could ask for and perhaps get, and I got that. And, they, and Lord Frost, bless him, stuck to that, and that's why I took the decision that I did in that general election wasn't an easy thing to do, given that I just don't really trust Johnson or the Conservative Party, but I didn't want my efforts, after all that I'd given to this, to result in the Lib Dems winning scores of seats in the southern and southwest of England, and perhaps the nightmare of a second referendum, and that's why I did what I did. People say today, Nigel, when you see Boris, do you regret what you did? No, it was the right thing to do. At that moment in time, it was the right thing to do. And I really believe that. OK, we'll do a couple more. There's, there's a cluster at the front here. Yeah, go on. Hi. Um, one of the most depressing things that I've noticed as an adult is the rise of what you might call um, a narco tyranny where there's an energetic enforcement of very petty laws that make your life a misery and a very light touch approach to, to quite serious crimes. It seems to be immune to whoever's in government and seems to have increased a lot maybe in the last decade. Uh, where do you think it comes from and what can be done about it? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, my drive to Gatwick Airport sums that up, doesn't it? You know, I mean, you know, I could have been fined God knows what if I hadn't, if, if I hadn't seen the sign that said, I've now got to pay five quid, Goodness knows what I'd have been fined. You know, I mean, if I'd driven down the motorway at 75 miles an hour, even on that nine-mile stretch, I might have had 14 tickets. Um, so, and, and is any of this surveillance stopping crime? Are any of the cameras in London stopping knife crime or drug dealing? No. And it kind of feels on so many of these things, it's almost the law abiding who make a minor incursion sometimes unwittingly, who finish up paying the price. It's rather like car insurance. If 
you drive around without car insurance, and you've got a criminal record, and you've got no money, and you have a series of accidents, they can't do anything to you. And yet the rest of us pay our car insurance, and if somebody goes into the side of us, we have a devil of a job to actually get the work paid for. So I'm afraid, where does it come from? Look, this is, this is part of the apparatus of a big state. As a state gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it does these things, and it believes in, it, it believes in its own mind that it's doing it for the right reasons. But it nearly always has the wrong outcomes. All right? Thank you. Okay, where have we got to? Where's the microphone? Would you want to give it to somebody? <laughs> right, I'll do these really quickly because we are pretty much out of time. Uh, thank you, Nigel, for tonight. You're the best Prime Minister we never had. Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> so great to see you. Love seeing you uh, um, on GBM. Um, what I wanted to ask you, and you probably everyone's asked you this, but we need you in politics. Not necessarily to stand as, you know, as, a, as an MP, but, you know, you, I think you did kind of refer to it in one of your tweets saying about the net zero thing. Yeah. Maybe a referendum on that. What are your plans in future, politically wise? Well, I'm pleased it's not personally, thank you. Um, the, the, look, the net zero thing I'm really serious about. Here's another issue that affects everybody, affects individuals, affects business, affects our standing in the world, our competitiveness, and it's happening. But how do we ever get to 25% of our electricity bills being greed subsidy with no public debate? How do we get there? Well, the reason's easy. Because the political parties all agree, most mainstream media agrees, this is good, therefore we do it with no debate. So I do intend on the net zero stuff to launch an initiative um, next month. That's coming quite soon. I try to use my voice, whether it's on GB News or through social media or whatever else it is, I do try to use my voice to try and raise issues that some would brush under the carpet, to try, to try and influence things. I've, I really have tried hard on this NHS vaccine mandate stuff and indeed you know, Dr. Steve James, who was with the other seven doctors, going to take the judicial review against the government, you know, did an exclusive on my show. So I'm still trying to influence things and change things. Um, party politics, well, I did it for a heck of a long time. Um, I'm not in any particular hurry to go back and do it again. I wouldn't really want to go and do it again. But you know what? Never say never. Okay, the gentleman there. Thank you, Nigel. Um, not only are you the best Prime Minister we never had, but you're also the best knight that we never had. Uh, uh, I, ho I, hope, I hope that all of us here celebrate my joy when Sir Tony was uh, brought to the Gaza. <laughs> but um, the point, and serious point that I want to make is the effect of the blob on our freedom today. Mm, 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 mm. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah. Me. I mean, look, you know, Cummings is many things. Um, an odd person. Um, a nightmare. And it's a very bad judgment of Boris to put him in number 10. But he's right about the blob. He's absolutely right about the blob. And all the while Cummings was there in Downing Street, you thought there might just be a chance of taking on the big civil service departments. Now that Cummings has gone, under this current leadership, there is zero chance of that happening. And yes, Minister was funny, but where we are today isn't very funny. And the fact they believe they can still go on working from home and enjoy not just good salaries, but incredible index linked pensions, and everybody else is paying for it, is an outrage. So you're right, but it's, it, but it, but it's rather like the question we were asked about the internet. You know, I can see the problem, but who the hell is going to sort it out? And to that, I just don't know the answer. But I do think 
Cummings going from number 10 has set us back on that rather than forwards. I genuinely do. Right, I'll do, um, right, I'll do one, two, three. There are five hands up. That's it. Keep your hands up. Make them quick because we are running very late. Sir. Would I be right in thinking that um, you don't agree with elected mayors being the um, answer to levelling up? Well, I would agree with elected mayors if they actually had the power to do things. Um, and I thought Ben Houchen raised a very interesting point. He said, if I'm allowed as an elected mayor to reduce taxes, to make this a competitive zone, then it might work. It works in America. Tax competition over borders between states works in America. I believe in competition. Give the mayor's power to do those things, and I might warm to the idea. At the moment, I think it's just been dividing our country up in a very, very bad way. I mean, a very expensive experiment. I, as, it, as it is, it's not worked at all. The Houchin idea might just work. Okay. The others. Yep, one there. Uh, John Strafford Beckinsfield. Um, Nigel Farage, your country needs you. <laughs> the people of this country are yearning for a voice to express their fear on freedom, democracy, liberty, and justice. I quite agree with you there's going to be a leadership election in the Conservative Party. You must get involved one way or another and speak for ordinary Conservative Party members and Conservative Party voters whose voice has just been eliminated by this woke, new Labour type Conservative Member of Parliament. I look for you to lead that ordinary voice of the British people. Well, John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've said already, if there was an open primary, I'd try and do it. As it is, what do you want me to do? Get five million votes in one seat? I mean, is that, do you really want me to do that? To put myself through years of misery, get millions of votes in one seat? I can't beat the first-past-the-post system. Even when you're on the verge of beating it, they cheat. They cheat industrially, and then an agent gets a suspended prison sentence. I mean, without electoral reform, it's, I mean, I, I, I'm not being negative, but it's bloody difficult. Excuse my language. It really is bloody difficult. Um, you know, no one's fought against this harder than me. No one's come closer to breaking it than me. And all right, we beat them on Brexit. We got that. But to actually break the system, if we had PR, the whole thing would be different. And there are arguments for it and arguments against it. But I will. One, one promise I will make you is I, I'm not going to go quietly whatever I do. All right? I'll make you that <laughs> You're the last one. There's two more. Okay, fine. Um, going back to Alex Phillips' point on yeah. internet influencing social norms and also internet censorship, would you say that perhaps rather than the government intervening and policing online content, the best way forward would be the free market approach, whereby you've basically got more competition, so from the likes of Parler, Gab, <laughs> Getter, all the rest of it, um, and the best way forward might be simply for all of us and like-minded people to join those platforms and say, well, okay, Twitter, you can be your own you know, echo chamber, but we all simply step outside. And then for government to simply, if it intervenes at all, to guarantee those platforms a, a, a space uh, with Google and uh, internet browsers. Well, browser. in theory, yes, but in practice, I'm not sure that's right. You know, Standard Oil got so big that the US government broke it up with the antitrust laws, all right? There are some times in the free market when firms get so big, their position becomes unassailable, and I fear with the big four, they are now unassailable. I wish all the challengers well, but I, you know, it, it, I doubt him, you know, it could be 10 years before that changes. So I get the idea, the free market solution, I like it, but I think we may need something more radical than that to happen. Right, okay, sir. There is actually a political establishment in the free world um, which is worse than ours. Is there? <coughs> which is Canada's. 
and I'm just wondering how far you think our lot have to go in Trudeau's direction before we get the equivalent of the Canadian truckers. Well, look, I think actually we are beginning to win the fight back. You know, Johnson called it an emergency four times on Macron, a backbench rebellion, commentators in press and newspapers, and now the vaccine mandate ended. We're not going, we are now heading in the right direction. Maybe slowly. What's happening in Canada is amazing. I don't like the Prime Minister being moved for his own safety. I don't want us to be on the side of mob rule. I want us to be Gandhi-style activists rather than urban terrorists. But at least there is a fight back happening in Canada. It's about blooming time. And the last question to Graham. Nigel, what do you think will happen first? A Putin invading Ukraine or China invading Taiwan? Well, look, all I'm going to say to you is this. If Donald Trump, for all his faults, was still in the White House, I don't think the Taliban would be in control in Kabul. I don't think Putin would have 130,000 troops massed on the Ukrainian border. I don't think little rocket man would be firing off the rockets in the way that he is. As for China, whoever's in the White House, they're going to pose the biggest military threat to us over the course of the next few years. Um, and we need a very, very strong United West to think very hard how we're going to confront that. Biden is a disaster. The German, the, the German Greens or Communists have now, made the, have now made Germany entirely dependent upon Putin so that Europe can't speak with one voice. I mean, there are good things about that too, but, but, but can't speak with one voice. Um, but I do think I do think weak American leadership is a massive problem here. Putin doesn't need to set foot into the Ukraine. He's won already. He's divided the West up. He's made Germany totally dependent upon him. He doesn't need to set foot across that border. Will he? Won't he? I don't know. I'm not so sure that he will, actually. I think it's a great big game of bluff. With that, thank you very much indeed, everybody. I've done my best. Thank you very much, Nigel. I don't know how you keep going for so long, but you always manage to. Let's give him another round of applause, please. Absolutely wonderful. The story Nigel told tonight about Patrick Moore, I have heard before. I will say that. Uh, but I, I, was re I was remembering... Um, Featherstone Working Men's Club. Now, that is not a place that I normally would go to. It's not a place that I normally would think uh, people politically would agree with me on. But I was at Featherstone Working Men's Club as a Brexit Party candidate in the, in the European elections almost now, three years ago. And I remember walking onto the stage, and I was wolf-whistled. Now, I have never been wolf-whistled in my life, ladies and gentlemen, but I was wolf-whistled going on to that stage where we all gave wonderful speeches. And quite frankly, you know, there's very few people who have changed the political weather in this country. But Nigel Farage is one of them. He really is. You can think of Clement Attlee, Margaret Thatcher, maybe Tony Blair and Peter Mandelson. But, yeah, well, we, we don't like them. We don't like them. I agree. I agree. Um, we would like Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> but, uh, but Nigel Farage is one of them. So very much uh, a big thank you, Nigel. Now, we in the Freedom Association are determined to keep spreading our 10 principles now of a free society. They're as vital as ever. Uh, a big thanks to our chairman, David Campbell-Bannerman, um, who spoke to you earlier this evening. And he wrote an excellent article in our members' magazine back in November, and it is on our website that, that you can read, where all of our 10 principles of a free society are really under threat. As he said, the 10th principle to do with freedom of speech assembly uh, and expression, we thought we never really needed to put that into writing. But such is the state of freedom in our country these days that we have had to put it into writing. Now, the Freedom Association is not one of those organizations that is just Westminster-based. It never has been. We've never been like that. 
And I'm looking forward now, every month this year, to going on the road. Uh, at the end of March, I'm in Exeter, where we have uh, William Yarwood, who's standing at the back. He's been helping with the microphone. He's the president of our Freedom Society at Exeter University, which is doing tremendously well. Uh, over 60 people come along to, to their various events. William will be speaking to us in, in Exeter on the 25th of March, uh, an MP will, and we also hope to get along a, a historian to talk about the Falklands War. But we will be replicating those meetings right throughout the country, all throughout the year. And that's what people want, because I don't know about you, but isn't it brilliant to be back in a room full of people again? <laughs> So all I have to say now is there is still some wine left in the bar. After that, you'll have to put your hands in your pockets, I'm afraid, you know. Freedom isn't free, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, please stay if you can. Have a few drinks with us. Make some new friends as well as speaking to old friends. And thank you so much for coming here this evening. And thank you once again to Nigel.